Hello, welcome everybody, and uh, I invite you to the second day of the IREC 2021 JEDA conference. Uh, we'll start shortly. <laughs> This uh, uh, fourth session uh, will be chaired by Luis Costa. However, Professor Costa will be a bit late for technical reason, so I, I will start introducing uh, my distinguished uh, guest here, uh, Professor Albert Sandra Moore from Open University of Catalonia in Spain. Uh, Robert Morse from U.S. News and World Report in the United States, Professor Grzegorz Mazurek, Rector uh, of the Kozminski University in Poland, and our very distinguished guest and uh, world expert on higher education, Professor Alan Hasselkor uh, from Ireland. Welcome you. And may I ask uh, Professor Morer to start, please? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to, to, to thank you for the invitation to, to be all together in this, in this very interesting panel. So I would like to, to, to thank all my colleagues also to be able to share with them this, this, uh, this round table. I would like to start by sharing my presentation, but I'm not sure if it has uh, already arrived uh, into the particular place. So in order not to uh, not not to uh, spend more time, I'm I'm going to start without the presentation. Okay. Uh, let me check that. Yes. Okay. Uh, your so I, your presentation yeah. arrived too late. So please continue without. Okay, thank you. So the, the, the thing is that I would like to start with uh, an idea that the learning was changing some years ago. Yeah. Uh, and online was on the spotlight. Those in, in that particular moment, uh, uh, we used in 2018, we used to say that uh, online education has a particular uh, features in the framework of higher education. Some of these features were that online education was continuously growing, but that at the same time, skepticism from some academics persisted, that emergence of low cost providers were questioning its quality for further purposes, that international rankings uh, did not consider online education, and that despite of the quality assurance tools, quality of online education remained under suspicion. At that particular moment, 2018, we start working in a European project that we call CODUR, that meant uh, creating an online uh, dimension of university rankings. In that project, we stated that uh, there were a lack of rankings for online education, that general rankings criteria harmed online education institutions, but that some rankings were becoming uh, uh, to be sensitive to the online education dimension. In the meantime, a pandemic arrived, and then online began to be in the spotlight even more than before. I used to, to say something that I like very much from, from a, a Nobel Prize, a Latin American writer that said, when we thought we had all the answers, suddenly all the questions would change. And I think this was what happened in that particular moment at the, at the very beginning of the big lockdown of the pandemic. So all the things we used to do were not useful. We start learning another way to do things and so on. So this was the reaction for, from most of us. After this pandemic, and I would like to say that 
it has finished, but unfortunately it didn't finish yet. Some provisory lessons we took from this pandemic. First that maybe in different forms, this could happen again, and we have to avoid the interruption of education. This is the most important thing. The second thing is that we did our best, but some things could be done much better. The third is that digital growth has resulted in the only feasible solution. In addition, the digital divide is still a great barrier. We know that. And the fifth uh, point is that remote teaching was not online education. And we can cite the uh, Hodges, Moore, Lockheed, and other people uh, work on that publishing at the course. Remote teaching is not exactly online education. And finally, that hybridization of learning is already here. Then, uh, in this situation, we, 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 has, uh, we have revisited the, 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 the traditional or the old tale of the emperor's new clothes. Online education was the emperor. And these new clothes were not the ones that we uh, expected. We, we, we all know that online education is or can be a fuzzy concept that its definition depends sometimes of everyone's use. Sometimes it's traditional distance education using new technologies. Sometimes it's learning with a strong technology-based approach. Sometimes it implies synchronous and asynchronous solutions, or maybe not. Or sometimes it is understood as simply a simple replica of classroom lectures, usually based on video lectures or as PDF delivery models or as an accessible repository of documents. All this leads to considerable confusion for those people who are really interested in, in it for the first time. So it's important to say what is quality online education. It is something that has to be planned, that has to be organized, that has to be demanding, and that has to be responsible. Maybe in one single word, it has to be strategic. And this strategy, should allow to make this quality online education flexible, personalized, interactive, and collaborative. Because in this way, it will become sustainable, accessible, and innovative at the same time. So to do that is not enough to uh, capture lectures, it's not enough to, to provide um, synchronous lectures from home to the students, this is a part, but this is not enough. So we need to put the student activity in the very center of, of the model. We need to identify how we will support the students as teachers with guidance, with interaction. We need to identify what are the learning resources that are the most important ones to support the process of learning from them for them the access to content, the different multiple formats in which this content can be uh, provided, the uh, diversified technology use, and finally, the, uh, the, the, the role of the networked community to collaboration, teamwork, knowledge building, sense of group from the peers that are participating as classmates in all the process of learning in online settings. So activity-based, Participation and engagement and continuous assessment are elements that will provide a good learning experience for the students in that way. So this idea of developing quality online education is very important to consider what online education is and what is not. But at the same time, we are not moving exactly to online education because this will be a matter of fact of, uh, of a particular model of universities that are providing to people that need this fully online solution for them, they are providing this kind of, of education. But we're moving to hybrid models because most of the uh, universities have identified that probably as universities has to keep being in presence, that is also true that some universities have experienced new approaches for teaching and learning and some of them, not all of them, but some of them have succeeded. And they know that this, this, uh, 
degree of flexibility that has provided the, the, the situation, the non-desirable situation of the, of the pandemic are providing them a, a new experience for the, for the learners too. So there are some conditions for a strong hybrid model that it, it has to be designed from a different look, not from face to face, but probably from online in order to, to keep all the opportunities that online are providing us uh, to design a different kind of, of, uh, of hybrid model. Usually when we are doing that, what we are doing is doing the same as we did face to face and just adding some technological elements. We should think that we need to move to a completely different approach in which hybrid could be something different to what we have been done until now. The second point is to dissociate time. It's not true that for learning, people should be at the same time the teacher and the student. Not always. In fact, sometimes even having a teacher in front of student, the student doesn't learn anything. So we, we, just, uh, we, we have to accept that and, and think that there is a time for learning and there is a time for teaching. Sometimes they could be the same. Sometimes they should be dissociated, working together in synchronous and asynchronous environments that will provide different new opportunities for learning for the students. Of course, for doing that, we need to make the autonomy and self-regulation of our students grow. And this is what I call the job of learning, the, the, the professionalism of learning. So we need to push our students to be much more professional learners in that sense, to develop their autonomy, and we should help them to do that, and to improve their self-regulation skills for that. Finally, Another element for, for a strong hybrid model is a formative, continuous and diversified assessment. So it's not true that assessment has to be done only face to face at the end of the process. We can assess everything during the process. We can use a lot of different ways for assessing. There are different actors that can assess the teacher, but also the, the peers, but also even the, the, the student, uh, him or herself, and all this can give us more information in order to make uh, uh, a fair assessment at the end of this process. So in order to make more my closing remarks, given the fact that I, 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 I could not use the, 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 the presentation, my, my, my statement is first of all, we should warn the fact that we should not replicate in presence classroom teacher, teaching when we are working online because the copy is always worse than the original. I've seen a lot of tries to do the same we are doing in the physical classroom to do it online. This is not the way for a quality online education. Given different context, we need different combination of strategies. But really now, my question is, how much have we learned from the pandemic situation? And, 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 and the answer I give to myself is that probably we are in a situation that I call the, the law of the pendulum. So we are coming back. I am afraid that things will come back as they were even if the context is quite different. We are trying to come back to the normal. But the normal is no longer the normal we knew at the beginning of the pandemic. Things have changed because as, as, as the river flows, the water is not always the same. And this is exactly the same thing when we are living. Our lives are different now than at the very beginning of the pandemic. So we are trying to do the same that we did. And I think this is not the correct way, but we will see that universities are trying to come back to the same uh, activities they did at the, uh, at the beginning. Rankings in that sense, answering the question of this uh, round table, should take into consideration what quality online or hybrid education mean. Most of the universities will move a bit 
into hybrid models if they move to uh, to somewhere. Uh, so it's okay, but there is a, a, a strong component of online in a hybrid model, or at least it should be. I cannot show you that, but the Kodur project I mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning identified uh, nine different uh, elements that were the, the, the components of the online dimension for university ranking. The quality of student support, the quality of teacher support, the quality of technology infrastructure, the quality of learning experience, the quality of research, the quality of teaching, the quality of the organization, the sustainability of the institution, and finally the reputation or the impact of the institution. It is true that some of these elements are the same in a face-to-face -face university, but you should treat them in a different way. In fact, the most important thing is that as you have not to replicate in presence classroom teaching, when you are trying to measure online education, you, you have to do not measure in the same way in presence classroom teaching than online or hybrid education, because you need to interpret the elements, the indicators in a different way. And that is, it's, it's really important. So this is what I think in that uh, moment, maybe in the answer, questions and, answer, and answers, we will talk a bit more on, on that. But my idea, my initial idea, okay, it seems that the presentation is being, is being presented now, okay. So it's that we have worked in the last, uh, the last month on creating a decalogue, uh, 10 points for improving of uh, online teaching from this perspective of quality online education. Very, very soon, in collaboration with the International Association of Universities, this book is going to be for free, downloadable, and in English. It probably in, 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 in January, it will be uh, uh, available for everyone. So we will be very, very, very happy if it's useful, useful for, for everyone. So, uh, it's all for now. Thank you very much. And I will be more than pleased to, to answer the questions later on. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Morer. You pointed out uh, rightly that uh, uh, distance learning will stay with us, but the problem will be how do we assure that it is applied rightly in right mo uh, portions and that we assure that there is a quality in it, uh, a good quality, because this is what we need. Well, we'll turn now to Robert Ungerst, uh, and uh, he will probably tell us a little bit if and how uh, rankings can uh, be an element of ensuring the quality of the distance learning. Bob? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I guess my presentation will go up in, in a second. Yes, yeah, so um, actually, US News is um, we've been actually listening, even though to what the previous speaker said, we've actually incorporated a lot of the points that that were made in, into the rankings that we're doing in online, and I will I will explain that in in, in a few minutes. And so we we've taken the in essence the theoretical to the impractical. But for those who aren't familiar with uh, with U.S. News, um, we're definitely uh, we're, we do many many rankings. We're in and these are the education rankings that we're doing. The the most recent online ones were in, in January of 2021. We also have best schools, best high schools, best colleges. We're in September. We just started doing best elementary and best middle schools. The the all the rankings the the first five that were we've done were only in, in the USA 
And around a month ago, we, we published our, our only global ranking, which was the best global ranking. Um, in terms of online education and, and the state of distance education, the, the, this is taken from, from the report that was published basically around two months ago um, by the U.S. Department of Education and in the enrollment from and around a year ago, the, the most COVID impacted period, it shows that, that the overall enrollment in, in U.S. higher education fell. This, this is in the fall of 2020 from the fall of, of 2019. So the, the, this shows the, the impact of, of, of COVID. But, uh, but, but within this data, there are important trends for online and, and distance education. Remember, th this is USA data only. It shows that the, and, and this would be in the fall of 2020 when, when many U.S. higher education institutions were, were, were online to a greater or lesser degree, but some degree. So it, uh, th this shows 44% of, of the students in the fall of 2020 were, were exclusively enrolled in, in, in distance education. And this is up 17% from the fall of 2019. So it's more than, more than double. Also, which is, also is, is part of the trend, it shows, which can be the difference between going totally online and, 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 and hybrid, that, that almost three quarters of U.S. students were enrolled in some distance education compared to only 37% in, in 2019. So it, it almost doubled dur during, during the pandemic. Um, the, the, the U.S. Department of Education said that, that the, what happened was definitely accelerated by, uh, by COVID. The distance education in the U.S. was, was pretty rapidly expanding but that the and and the, the trends that i just mentioned were, were the largest changes in, in the data now as, as as a previous speaker mentioned it's hard to tell what's happening right now meaning in the current academic year but it, but it looks like these trends are going to be reversed to some degree whether it's going to go back to the way it was in 2019 is yet to be seen but it's definitely peaked in terms of the COVID impact. But, but, uh, but I want to start my story quickly by I'm going backwards to, um, to, to, to 2012 when, when U.S. News first um, distance education, online education was rapidly expanding in the U.S. and, and no other publication was, was ranking or trying to assess the quality of higher education. And U.S. News took up the challenge. Um, the, the, this led to our rankings, and there wasn't any real data you could get at the program level. But but we built our own surveys, and, and we did did our own data collection. And the, the typical online learner. So who who what, what is our information for? They they value degrees that are affordable and com completed in a reasonable time. And they want to go go to quality programs, and they want to advance their careers. Um, the and this is an important distinction of, of the rankings that U.S. News is doing and has been doing since 2012. Where we're defining an online program is is where more or less all the required coursework for the program. This is degree coursework can be completed online by internet-based learning. And, and it can be either asynchronous or, or synchronous. And it, this does mean that some um, orientations and tests and, and other skill buildings and, and certain, um, certain things can be face-to-face. But, uh, but, but the four credit learning can't be to be considered an online program. Um, so as I said, we're, we, our online rankings are, are, are tailored, especially our bachelor's degree program rankings are tailored to the non-traditional students they, they've employed, they've earned some college credit and, and their age in their twenties through the forties. So, 
So in the bachelor's degree level, the online education, it isn't for people just graduating college. Um, we, 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 we are incorporating a lot of the indicators that the previous speaker mentioned. We're assessing the programs of credential faculty, engaging in, in the correct learning systems and, and can support their students through, through technology. Um, at, at least in, in the U.S., we, we do not want to state this, uh, that, that some of our, our competitive rankers are ranking online MBA glo and globally. Some, some people are ranking online MBA and, and graduate business programs like, like finance or marketing or project management. But um, we're definitely the, the only public that's doing comprehensive in-depth assessment of online degree programs beyond the, the, the MBA level. And, and we're certainly the, the only U.S. ranker who's, who's actually collecting online degree program level data. And, and, and there are some other U.S online rankings that are using U.S. Department of Education data, which is on the entire school level and, and trying to apply it to an online program. So th this, can be, this can be confusing to students because they're, they're, they can be lead generation sites. Um, the, the U.S. rankings aren't individual online courses, which is to a great degree was happening during during the pandemic meaning when harvard or yale or or university of pennsylvania went online that 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 was a transition to hopefully go back to face to face versus a specific online degree course so so for the uh, for the rankings that, that were published in january 21 we, we have our bachelor's degree, we do an online MBA, an, a graduate business that's not an MBA, graduate education, graduate engineering, graduate nursing. The, the, these are eight separate rankings. We're also doing a bachelor's degree in business and psychology. So you can see that in the, in the 2021 edition, we rank 1,641 programs. And, and the first time we did it, there, there was around 700 programs. So the, the, the amount of online degree programs, th th this is not online education, it's programs that, that lead to a degree is, is really re still rapidly rising in the United States. Um, this will give you give you an, a sample of, of the online to be bachelor's program methodology. It does actually pick up some of the indicators that were mentioned previously. We have peer reputation. We measure indebtedness. We measure graduation rates, faculty quality, the best practices of how they deliver their degree, support services, the infrastructure, um, how, how prepared the faculty are to, to teach online. Um, the, does the online program administer assessments, a retention, and tenure track faculty? So we, no, okay. So the, the, the this is actually the, the online degree program rankings from the, these bachelor's degree rankings, which are degree completion. For those who don't know what that means, that that means the students have, have some credit and they're not starting as first time first year students are getting some credit for their life experience or previous coursework. But, but, but the most interesting thing about our results is besides the school that, that, that was number one, all the other schools are, are more or less all very large U.S. public universities who who they're, and many of their, their flagship public universities or started online education. And, 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 the, and the top ranked schools are, are these major research public universities in, in the US. 
<clears throat> and they and they aren't the for-profit schools that sometimes did get a lot of publicity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to give you some brief. Also, this is for an online MBA program. The, these are pro degrees that that actually grant MBA degrees. The these aren't degree degree completion. These are students who are taking all their courses in the in the online MBA program. We we have student engagement, um, student excellence. This is some entering class um, credentials and accreditation. We have reputation, faculty credentials, and student learning technologies. Um, so the, the, these are the top ranked online MBA programs, as in the other rankings, or the rankings we're doing are only uh, of USA schools. Now, the, this, this is an interesting list because they're, once again, these are major U.S. universities. Some of them are private, Carnegie Mellon, University of Southern California, Rice, Lehigh, but, um, but they're all but they're all large or, or fairly large US public universities who who have and who who tend to have a bricks and mortar MBA program and but but, but have also launched an, an online M MBA program. And 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 they aren't the I'm not trying to cut up the University of Phoenixes of the world, but 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 they aren't the for profit colleges. And one note about our rankings is is that schools have to fill out the surveys to um, participate. So the the online many of the largest for profit and some very large public online programs like University of Maryland University College now it's University of Maryland Global don't fill out the surveys. I'm, we think it's because they don't want to be assessed as part of our, our rankings. So I guess in summing it up, we've actually taken the, the theoretical to the practical and, and we've actually incorporated, maybe that'll make the previous speaker smile because we were listening because your tree was falling in a forest and we couldn't hear it, but we actually, we we're using a lot of the indicators that you said should be used. Well, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I agree in, in 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 a U.S. news ranker sense versus an in-depth sense. Yes. Well, thank you, Bob, and uh, it's nice to see all of you. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, I have some technical problems here. Albert, Bob, uh, Helen, Hector, Kazmierz, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and. Um, I was following here uh, uh, the presentation from Albert and Bob, and I'm very pleased by the nice work that they have been doing. And I am sure that uh, I used to say that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was a kind of accelerator for uh, distance learning. I don't know if the situation is everywhere, but uh, the people that I have been talking with in Brazil, in South America, and even uh, Europe, in North America, students don't want to go fully again on campus. Okay, they, they are missing on campus activities, but they now discover that, uh, okay, it's nice, I can use technology, I can have more, more discipline, I can have more time management, so I want uh, to work a little bit uh, uh, kind of blended learning. I am sure that uh, that's going to be our future, to, to have on campus face to face, but also to have more uh, distance learning or blended learning uh, that we may call it uh, use of, uh, of technology as uh, teaching learning for the teaching learning environment. So it's very important that the rankings and uh, we saw now what uh, uh, Bob is doing, there is a very nice work and Albert is doing there. But uh, I think it's very important now to hear from a point of view of a Hector, if my feeling is okay, or if you think that uh, 
it's going to be a, a different way. Please, Hector, the floor is yours. All right. I hope right. I can be I can be heard well. Uh, I don't have any presentation. Thank you, Luis, for for giving me the floor. I don't have any presentation, but I was uh, listening very carefully to my uh, uh, fantastic speakers about uh, their perception of online uh, learning and online environment. So I have. Uh, let me be clear and concise, and I'll just present to you a couple of my thoughts. Uh, first of all, obviously, there is an aspect of uh, keeping the quality uh, of online education on a high level. The question is, how, how can we do it? Uh, obviously, we have at least two uh, institutions who can measure the quality of online education. The first uh, is a uh, regulatory, re regulatory body, meaning the government, the ministries of higher education, who have a lot of... Um, procedures and requirements to conduct online studies well. Second, in my opinion, more important uh, institution which regulates the quality, which um, proves or checks the quality of online education is uh, accreditation institutions. Uh, I'm from business school, so uh, I can say it very directly. There is one institution globally known, which is EFMD, which is European Foundation for Management Development, who certifies uh, online education programs. So just like uh, the institutions provide accreditations for institutions or accreditations for particular types of studies, they have also accreditation for online programs. So, in my opinion, the area of uh, keeping the quality from institutional point of view is already taken. There is obviously second um, uh, stakeholder who evaluates the quality of online education, which is obviously the market. So, the students. And here come, uh, for instance, the rankings. I am, I am against creating a ranking for online education. I am for rankings which evaluate online programs of particular type. So for instance, just like Bob said, we have MBA online ranking. We have, let's say, master degree online uh, uh, ranking. We have bachelor studies online ranking, so on and so forth. So it's not about the meaning that it's online or offline. It's, a, it's about the, uh, sorry, it's not about the format online offline, it's about the type of studies like on the pyramid where you have bachelor, we have master, we have PhD, and so on and so forth. This discussion is not the most important one, in my opinion. Uh, what is much more important is that, um, yes, we say that a pandemic period uh, created, the facilitated, and speed up the uh, digital transformation. And now we have a lot of conference and talks, so what does it mean? In my opinion, what is the biggest uh, uh, challenge which we are facing right now is that uh, from the perspective of the market, again, there are a lot of alternative programs, educational services, which are provided to them, which are bypassing the traditional uh, uh, system. So, for instance, we have, let's say, MBA programs, but right now we have a lot of master classes, short programs, where students using online education take, can take advantage of those alternative uh, 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 products. Let's put it simple. So in my opinion, what really pandemic period created is the speeding up of the changes which are happening on educational market. Because what I like to say is that really we shouldn't take for granted that we have bachelor, master, MBA programs, because those are kind of a global currencies, but they are able to be changed very quickly if the market decides to do it. So for instance, maybe instead of having one year postgraduate program in something, it's much better to take six weeks, uh, fully interactive, uh, uh, well-prepared uh, by great people course online, which actually fulfills more or less the same needs. So actually what, hap what is happening is, uh, is the one huge question mark what the universities are for in the new pa post-pandemic era where online education is going to stay uh, uh, with us uh, for sure for forever because 
uh, it's not only the the possibilities it gives it's it's mostly because the the market meaning the clients meaning the students sorry if i put the uh, uh, equal mark between students and clients but it's not about the that's a business perspective it's more about fulfilling their needs so much more broadly much broadly so uh, what i see that people really need it and people want online education so so we are not in the era of some phase which will uh, 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 be finished soon. No, no, we are going more and more into online formats, and for sure that will that will happen. Um, what I think, as a last sentence of my of my uh, uh, talk, is that uh, very important elements of of this trust towards universities with online programs comes from regula regula regulations, uh, uh, from, from bodies which regulate the market. So accreditation institutions and governmental uh, regulations are very important in order to help us uh, to keep up with the ch fast changing market. Uh, what is the result if the regulations are not helping us to be ready for co for very competitive market the solution will be given by alternative institutions which are not regulated so using different example you have for instance banks banks are highly regulated banks provide various types of services and sim simultaneously you have growing exponentially growing a market of fintech industry which is not regulated which is thanks to that able to provide to the clients uh, uh, new innovative solutions without uh, using the handicaps of regulations which traditional banks have to fulfill so we are more or less in in higher education institutions we are on, in the in the same more or less a phase and we have three regulatory bodies it's a government with with bills with with uh, uh, with specific uh, regulations we have uh, uh, ranking institutions and we have accreditation institutions so if those three elements will help us as as universities to move forward everything is going to be okay for the market for the ecosystem if we are going to have a lot of constraints nobody is going to wait for us simply speaking we'll have a lot of companies a lot of uh, uh, startups who will uh, uh, mm, start serving the the students the market with alternative ways of of educating mostly thanks to online uh, uh online uh, modes thank you thank you thank you very much it's very important talk you, you done there uh mainly coming from a great university as close big university that has a lot of experience in distance learning uh, the point of regulation that you brought out, it's very important one everywhere. And uh, also what you said about, uh, okay, we don't need to have a ranking to look just at distance learning. They, 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 I agree with that because what we need to look is about quality. At the end of the day, ranking are supposed to indicate to us about the quality of uh, university. And uh, we know how difficult it is to measure teaching quality, even face to face. But uh, I have finished uh, a review paper on uh, emergence distance learning that uh, has been doing during the pandemic times in all universities. And uh, what I could see is uh, the main issue where firstly engagement. It's, it's completely different to teach for people online and face to face. So engagement was a problem and also assessment it's i'm not talking about proctoring i'm talking about assessment i mean but i i, I think we we have some lessons to be learned uh, firstly are we really teaching what is needed or we need to change a little bit uh, what we're teaching for the students and secondly secondly are we doing uh, the assessment that makes sense or not so there are some questions for us to discuss if you agree uh, that uh, uh, distance learning or blended learning are here to stay but now we have 
a great specialist, uh, the Professor Helen Halsbom, that is going to talk with us uh, to say her point of view. And I'm sure that uh, I would like to share with you also that uh, she has a great book that is going out just now. We will show also this book that's going to help us. But uh, Professor Helen, it's nice to have you here. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and um, thanks to my uh, fellow um, speakers, all hugely interesting. I have to say the issue of online learning um, has become absolutely the, um, the key topic in, or one of the key topics in, in higher education. Um, even before the pandemic, I think Bob was referring to this, and the numbers that you had, Bob, are, are really quite are hugely interesting from, from the U.S. Um, perspective. Um, is really looking at the online market um, and the data that I have is about 350 billion um, was the forecast for the, the online market by 2025 and clearly those may be changing. Um, yes, and I, there's been a lot of growth in terms of online learning platforms and indeed in the, um, in the private and particularly the for-profit um, end of the spectrum in terms of looking at um, types of provisions and where they're coming from. And I think the key issue we've seen is precisely, as has been indicated, um, what's often called the emergency phase or the emergency move to um, online, which um, has certainly took people unprepared and um, uh, for what was before them, a survey done in the Irish case suggested that more than 70% of academic staff had never taught online, and then clearly everything was online. Um, I also have to say that I would agree with uh, many of the comments that have been made that suggest that um, we're moving probably to a much more blended and hybrid um, environment. Um, Interest, it is interesting that the survey data I have looked at as well suggests that that students are not um, wholly against online and nor are the academic staff. Um, different reasons, different circumstances, um, certainly, but um, ultimately we are down to the issue of quality. And I think that is really the fundamental issue that underpins everything it's both the quality of the programs it's the it's the recognition the global recognition of the qualification um, itself and the ability that it's mutually recognized by others by employers and in other countries and hence that draws us really to the importance of the global convention the unesco global convention on um, recognition of qualifications in 2019 which is now doing the rounds for countries to sign up. It'll be the first legally binding UN treaty on higher education, and there are regional conferences around it. So I think that the move to online uh, learning is part and parcel of also the changing environment that we're in, in terms of as we move towards more universal participation, but also the changing um, nature, the diversity of the, of the student cohort um, and so on. Um, some interesting question though as to whether or not we can pick up the issues that were raised by Professor Moore. I'm interested in your Cordor um, uh, project. I see it was um, supported by Erasmus Plus and um, yeah, it's, it includes a wide range of types of, of issues that are important. Um, and in fact, to some extent, they match on to the types of things that ENQA, which is the European Network of Quality Assurance Agencies, um, has identified as, as increasingly important. I expect that's one of the difficulties when you look at, at a ranking situation is that it tends to simplify this information and um, reduce it down to things that we actually can't understand. The issues around infrastructure. Well, what, what about the infrastructure? I mean, is the infrastructure suitable? Um, who's judging that? How is it judged? Is it institutional data? How do we look at these things? Um, 
is it's not just academic expertise in terms of qualification, it's actually qualifications in um, teaching and learning online, digital learning. Um, that's a different thing. I'd like to, to know that people were actually qualified in that. It's, it's a much more complex set of, set of issues. It has to do with the institutional support, um, the structure, the issue that was also raised about synchronous and asynchronous um, learning assessment. So it's the design, the delivery, the assessment um, that's, that's going on. And a wide range of these types of issues um, seem to me to be at the core when we get and we talk about um, the issue of, of quality. In that regard, um, the issue around um, international accreditation, particularly business schools, it's a bit, or some of the other professions, that's um, certainly catered for the FMD has a long um, tradition of that and the ASSB in the US and so on, um, also accredit um, business schools. But I think what we're looking for is um, national systems of accreditation, regional accreditate, accreditors that operate on an international um, level and operate to international standards so that the accreditor themselves are externally accredited. I think that's one of the problems we've seen in the US with some of the um, um, for-profit accreditors that have emerged. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that, but I think the main issue is is that I think um, I think it's important to recognize and to thank IREG for putting the issue of online learning on the agenda, and particularly for the large focus on the issue of quality. That to me, it seems, is the, is the global issue. Um, I think UNESCO has, has identified quality as the major reform issue of higher education at this moment, and I certainly would agree. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ellen. It's uh, quite interesting you're talking at uh, the end of your um, presentation. It's for me, it sounds like new here, it's uh, quality. Always when we talk about the rankings, we are discussing about quality education. And the question to be asked is, are rankings helping? higher education quality around the world to improve higher education quality. And my point of view, yes, they are, they are. Of course, we know they are not perfect, but uh, they are helping. People are talking about rankings, about quality, try to improve. Uh, and I think what this is more difficult, we know that it's about teaching, how to measure teaching. Uh, so we, we still have uh, five to six minutes. I would like to go around with all of you. If he, there is anything else that you want to add, uh, shall we start with Albert? Albert, I didn't say hello to you here, but it's a great pleasure to be with you again. Last time we were together, we were in Brazil before the pandemic, and Albert was here, and he was uh, very helpful for us because he showed all his experience in distance learning. Thank you again, Albert. Nice to see you. Hope to see you face to face in a few months. Muito obrigado, Luis. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I would not like to add a lot of things because uh, I, I really appreciate all, all the, the comments of uh, my colleagues in that sense. The, the only thing that I would like to highlight in that sense is that when we are talking about quality, we should take into consideration some important issues. When we talk about the regulatory bodies that are um, identifying some rules on, on online education, or when we talk about the accreditation institutions, we always are talking about a minimum level of quality. So this is our, the the elements that we are uh, uh, required to, to, to take into consideration in our model in order to be accredited or to be permitted to perform as a, a program or as institution. But when we talk about the rankings, we have a, a, a wide range of possibilities because probably we can 
um, wider or, or make the, the level higher. We cannot limit to the minimum level of quality, but we can widen it to the highest level of quality, and then we can measure other things. It's true, as, as Luis said, uh, that uh, rankings are helping to get quality. Of course they are, but I think that they could help more. Hence that identifying the elements could be a, a good way to But the other side of the problem, most of the people, the regulators, most of the people in the institutions, no matter if they write but the public, people coming from to face institution from a face to face experience on teaching and learning. So they don't know exactly the elements that can help to measure the highest quality of education. And that's just a big problem. I, I agree very much with uh, my colleague uh, my colleague Dr. Hasselkorn on, on on the topics they have mentioned because I think that see because at the time they are good just doing the same with some technology and this is online so all we said that everything comes to be online or everything was online or became became online but when we say that we are only saying that we use a particular technology for doing the same and this is the different thing and i agree with dr hasselkorn on the fact that the most important point is the teaching and the online teaching and learning training and experience of the teachers. And most of the face to face universities don't have this, at least at the very beginning. And I think this is a crucial point in order to identify what quality education online and what is not, maybe. At least, maybe, yet is not. So, it's, it's all for now. I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you, Albert. Uh, you have made a very important uh, distinction there, and uh, the regulator and the accreditation and the high quality. It's it's very important to have that in mind because uh, in some countries, for example, in Brazil, the regulator was very strong. So people, universe, normally they try to the minimum. And it's not good for education. We need to look uh, to improve our uh, uh, teaching quality beyond the regulatory needs and the, the, the accreditation needs. Thank you. Uh, Bob, uh, can you please add something uh, to our discussion? Okay. I'll make a few quick points. Um, well, first of all, um, Ellen, Ellen's point is very valid about the online is a very big business that the, I'm not sure what my words are coming through, but online has become a very big business. The, the institutions in the U.S. rely on, tend to rely on private companies to build their infrastructure. And, and there is there is a business model behind what they're doing because the major universities are using online education to extend their reach beyond face-to-face -face education. I'll also make this big philosophical comment about, and, and it's not meant to be answered, but remember this is from a fellow ranker. Do, do the rankers have too much power? Are, are we in in the right position to have this power because our tools that we can use, which was Ellen's point, can can we only measure things on the simplistic level versus the level that they're needed? Um, you know, we can measure whether how much to to a limited degree the how much practice a, a teacher has and how they've been trained to teach online, but it can only scratch the surface. So the, a, a ranking is only a ranking, and and people should just think about before giving the rankers of anywhere too much power over what's being done. Those are my comments. Thank you, Bob. Thank you again, uh, Hector. And, 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 and I haven't heard from Ellen, but I but I listened to Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, Hector Mazarak, the floor is yours. I uh, just uh, use one sentence because we are tight on schedule. Uh, well, I, th I think um, it's a new planet we are on right now. And I, by planet, I mean the completely new environment and completely new challenges we are facing, uh, which is a good thing because uh, it, uh, uh, it is something which uh, makes us stick. Uh, meaning we have a lot of work in front of us so so and that's good and uh, uh, something what I think the, the most important buzzword if I can call it this way is trust because uh, regulations accreditations rankings those are all for one single thing for creating trust towards particular universities particular programs particular uh, uh, institutions who provide uh, the education. So uh, it's a huge challenge for all of us to use online wisely. And, uh, and I think this is also very, very exciting. So that's why many of us will have a lot of work in the nearest future. <laughs> Thank you, Hector Mazarek. Uh, Helen, the floor is yours to make your final comments and to try to summarize the great discussion that uh, we have here. Yeah, thank, thank you very much and, and thank you all. And um, I'm sorry we're not together. I'm not sure the last time I've seen you, Bob. So um, it's nice to really see you on screen. Um, yeah, so this is a really interesting discussion. And um, um, I have to commend, um, again commend, it's, it certainly is a much um, higher and richer level of discussion than one might have, have thought um, looking at the topic. Um, I think, in fact, on the issue of big business, it's actually quite interesting, Bob, that on that, um, on your point, and it is big business, it's quite interesting the results then, when you look at those together with the results of the of uh, the sir, of the rankings of the US News, and is that telling us something about where that business is? And you're absolutely right. It is about the large um, universities and big issues being raised about it, um, extending their um, their, their reach, um, not just nationally, but, but certainly um, globally. Um, so that's an important thing to be said. I think the other key issue that comes across is that the issue of quality um, um, crosses, it doesn't matter what form is the delivery. If it's in your bricks and mortar on campus or online, quality is quality. And we have previously looked at online as a cheaper option. So it always worries me. Cost is important. It's value for money as opposed to the books. But um, we've seen online learning as a cheaper version, as a lesser version for other people as opposed to those. And we need to um, ensure that the quality is the same regardless of, of the form of delivery and that um, we recognize that the, we need to ensure that there's no stratification that enters into the system based on what is um, a danger that those who can afford to be on, on campus in elite institutions will end up at the top of the um, totem pole and those who are going to online are in something else that's more inferior. So um, that comes back to that issue fundamentally about quality. I think the difference um, of having those assessments that um, go beyond just the kind of the limitations that Bob rightly um, point out that can't be done is that the kind of quality assurance reviews that you get, they are time consuming, they do involve a lot of uh, both a lot of resources, but they do include a peer review element to it that you can't get by just looking at the numbers. And um, those are important aspects that we need to carry forward. So um, thank you again very much. Thanks to all my colleagues for a really interesting discussion and very timely. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you for you that have been following us uh, since yesterday. Thank you for the nice discussion that we had here about uh, distance learning. I'm sure that in the future we are going to discuss uh, much more about it. And uh, just to remind you 
that uh, next year we are going to be in Poland, Warsaw. Uh, I'm very sure that we are going to be face to face for the Iraq 20 years anniversary. So thank you all. Have a, all uh, a nice day.